Fast air, fast air. We need your help, okay? What do you, can you ask for us to do? Do you want us to put a strobe on everything around us within 300 meters? Totally and utterly destroy. We are surrounded. They have taken all lights out. Roger, I have a strobe. I have a strobe. Happy friendlies, happy friendlies. And I need you to leave your strobe on if you can. Hey everybody, welcome back to 10% True. This is just a quick heads up that there's some video in this podcast that you may want to watch. So if you're listening to the audio version and there's some moments of silence, that's because actually there's some video on the screen and, and Ned is probably explaining what's happening in those. And also to let you know that there's actually two versions of the heads up display tape that Ned recorded on this mission. The first is a, a sequence of uh, clips that is about five minutes long, contains all the audio as well. And if you stay till right at the end, then there's a shorter segment, which is a repeat of some of that, about two minutes of it, where Ned actually talks you through it. So we've done this so that you can listen to, once he's talked through the mission or talked through the lead up to the mission, you can listen to the actual audio and watch the heads up display tape for the most sort of compelling parts of that. And then if you want him to explain what's being said and what's happening, he does that right at the end. Of course, if you like this episode, please share it. Please give it a thumbs up. And if you're not subscribed to the channel, then subscribe and hit the bell button to make sure you get notified of the next episode. Enjoy. Ned, welcome to 10% True. Thanks for joining us on the podcast. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. We, we met uh, back in 2005. So I was researching a book, which I'll, I'll flash up quickly. if You can see it, uh, the audience at home, on the F-16 and its uh, combat operations out in uh, Iraq in March 2003, which was um, Operation Iraqi Freedom. Um, and I come to the Alabama Air National Guard at Montgomery, uh, Alabama, to meet uh, some pilots in the F-16 unit there, and you were one of them. And the other guy I met was uh, Brian uh, Wolf, whose call sign was Wolfman. Uh, and getting talking to both of you, I think it was individually, but eventually we came together. I found out that there was this particular mission that you had flown out in the Iraqi desert to support a special operations unit, and uh, it was a fantastic story. Um, and that's what the purpose of our call today is, is for, for us to listen to you uh, describe that mission. Um, unfortunately, Wolfman died in a car accident, so he can't join us, but otherwise I'm sure he would be here today to, to join in the conversation. Um, so that's the backstory. Let's start a little bit with uh, some conversation about you. Can you give us a brief outline as to, to who you are, what your Air Force career was like, and what you'd done up until the point you went out to Iraq in 2003? Okay, I've, I have one of these kind of disjointed uh, careers because I started out as a WIZO in F 111s, actually stationed at RAF Upper Hayford uh, back in the 80s. So I went to navigator training first and then the F 111 in England. And then I, got, then I got accepted to pilot training. I wore glasses at the time. So uh, that was the reason I went to navigator training first. So I had that kind of background and um, to begin with. And I went to pilot training at your NATO joint jet pilot training in JEPT at Shepard Air Force Base in 1990. Graduated there and got the F-16, went to McDill, uh, went to Kunsan, uh, Pope Air Force Base, and back to Kuhn, the Kuhn. And then I went to Luke Air Force Base as an instructor. And, got, and I got out. I joined the Alabama Guard and started flying for Delta. And um, we... You know, after 9-11, uh, we were activated to do Operation Noble Eagle. So we were setting alert around the United States. And at that time, our airplanes were updated with different avionics, um, better targeting pods, because Air National Guard was able to, you know, bypass a lot of the bu bureaucracy in that area. And we had data linking radios. So we were called F-16C plus Block 30s. So it was this plus in there because we had the, Lightning II targeting pod and the data linking radios, saddle is what we call it, S A D L, saddle. And so with saddle, you can see in your multifunction display, which we call the MFD, in your MFD, you can 
you can see all your flight members on the screen and you can tag one of them. You can see where they are in relation to your head, your headset display. And at that time, we didn't have a helmet mounted sights yet. You could check the fuel state and the weapon state of your wingman or your flight lead as well. So a lot of, you know, advanced capabilities for the time. Um, so in 2002, things were heating up in Iraq again, and we got word that we might go to the war. So we started training with our data linking radios and saddle. And this is in Alabama, which is a lot of timber. So we were using, uh, we were, our mission was going to be scud hunting in Western Iraq. And we're going to a base called Base X, which now you can read in open source that it was in Jordan. And so we were, our mission was totally going to be scud hunting. And there was a lot of special ops in that area too. So we knew we were probably going to be supporting them too. And it ended up, we did a lot of road recce for them. Anyway, in 2002, we're doing our training. And so we're using the uh, timber truck or logging trucks because they'd have these long log or trees on the trucks, which look like scud launchers. So that's what we were training with um, to, to practice. We didn't know when we would deploy. So it was like up in the air. So, you know, we were always on pins and needles you know, trying to figure out when are we going to go. And so we ended up going in February of 2003, we deployed and took our F-16s to the Middle East. And then we were flying on day one. I flew on the first day of the war out scud hunting. And the mission with Wolfman was on 30th of March of 2003. So night, over 19 years ago. But I don't think there's been one day that I haven't thought about this mission because it was the most probably I know it was. It was the most intense mission I've ever flown in my life. And it was in combat. And when I play the the HUD tape in a moment, and you know, Steve, that it's it's pretty intense when someone's calling for help like this. There's only one solution, and that's to go down and help. Well, so that's my background, and that brings me up to the mission. So you want me to continue with that? Just just pause it for a moment. So so just to create the timeline then. So so the uh, night one was the 19th of March, I think. Um, so you had been flying, you could get your logbook out. <laughs> yeah, I think it was. I, think it was the I, night, think I the could look back at my logbook. But it had been, been about 11 days then prior. So you've been flying combat for about 11 days when this particular mission took place. And, right. Um, can, can I just understand then, or can you describe to the audience then a little bit about the, um, I think it was called counter TBM, wasn't it? Counter th uh, right. theater ballistic counter missile. Theater missiles. So, so the, what, what was a, a counter TBM mission? What were the sort of tactics you described that you were training in the U S against those logger trucks? Cause they resembled them, but, but does that suggest lots of low level? Does it suggest that you've got this advanced targeting pod for the time, the lightning two with the, with a higher resolution, better capabilities that you were going to be using a lot of that sort of technology the saddle piece resonates, I guess, with the ground element, them being able to maybe spot something. And I don't know, did they beam it up to you? What, what, what was the mission? What did it look like in terms of how it would be executed and flown? Well, everything had to be conducted about 10,000 feet for one because of the threat. And so going below 10,000 feet will go against the ROE, the rules of engagement. So we had that going or going against us in some ways. So we had to be up about 10. So we were usually in the 20s, 20 to 25 block. Um, when we briefed, we we had so many pubs and books and maps, and we're just, you know, you just shoved that into your bag. And um, one of them was a list of coordinates, what we call hide sites, H-I-D-E, where the, the skies would hide during the day and then they would move at night and they would hide underneath uh, highway bridges and overpasses and wadis and so forth, wherever they could hide. So we would go out and we would look using our targeting pod. We were just, there was like several hundred points that we could actually look at. And on our maps, we, the whole Western region of Iraq was broken down into kill boxes. 
So there's just lat long boxes. So we would go, we would be assigned a kill box. So we'd go to that kill box and then we'd just fly around and we'd go hit all the different points on our steer point page. Um, and then we'd look in the targeting pod and search around. And so the flight lead is doing that. And the wingman's job is just to stay outside and look for threats. So, you know, undetected uh, SAMs or AAA. And of course we had a radar warning receiver. We had a, a LQ-131 pod for jamming. Um, so we'd have all that going at the same time. So we would, we'd take off and we'd refuel over Saudi Arabia and then we'd go into Iraq and Western Iraq and go to the kill box and just orbit around. It was really boring in a lot of times. Had, had you up until oh, this point, had you had much trade then? Had you, you just said it was boring. So were you dropping a lot prior to the 30th? Oh, you really weren't dropping a whole lot. Um, you, you know, you'd find something that looked like a scud and then you'd have to get permission. So now you're going through Bondo was the call sign. It was a, a British AWACS out in Western Iraq. And so you would ask them and, you know, go through their command and control. And so I, I, I guess they're communi communicating with a KOC. Um, uh, not even sure how to even, all these acronyms. Combined Air Operations KOC Center. and all that. The, the Air, Air Operations Center or the Coalition uh, or Combined Air Operations Center. So um, it's like your hands are tied a lot. It's like I found something that looked like a scud. It's on the move and you're wanting permission to attack and then you're denied hmm. and then sometimes you were getting calls from some special ops guys wanting road recce so now you're just you're finding them and then you're looking at your targeting pod you know 10 15 miles ahead of them and you're just going back and forth along the road seeing if you see anything and then you're just you're basically being in eyes and ears for them so we were doing ntsr which is non-traditional um reconnaissance um and then there's all you know the you got the counter um you know theater ballistic missiles we were saying seek and destroy we're ntsr ntsi sr if i'm saying these acronyms wrong please forgive me it's been 19 years it's pulling this out of my memory <laughs> um but the bottom line is we're going out to the kill box and we're searching for scuds and we're ended up doing road recce. And then sometimes we'd be just given, okay, uh, I need you to drop your, your, uh, JDAMs on these coordinates. And you're like, shit, hot, let's do it. So, you know, the weather's crappy down below us or whatever. And we're just dropping a bomb, which there's, there's no, um, skill to that, to dropping a, a JDAM, which is the GPS guided bomb. You're just dropping on some coordinates and then the GPS is guiding to the target. And so you, you usually have about 30 to 45 minutes of play time for now you got to go back out and refuel. So we're flying six to eight, six to nine hour missions and then going back home and, you know, half the time bringing your bombs back or, you know, one day I dropped, so our configuration was we only had one air to air missile. We had an AIM-120. We didn't even have an AIM-9 because there was no air to air threat. So you got one AIM-20, you got a JDAM on the left wing, 2000 pounds. So it's a Mark 84 with the guidance from the GPS. And then you got two GB-12s on the other wing, which are, um, they're Mark 82, 500 pound bombs. So you've already got a thousand pound difference um, with your bombs. So then you you drop your, one day I dropped both laser guided bombs, you know, hitting a communication center. And I got to fly home with a 2000 pound bomb on the other wing. So you're just kind of got a lot of rudder in there and, you know, rudder trim because the airplane's flying, you know, all cockeyed. So, um, and then you're landing on a, fairly short runway that was bombed in this the six day war in 1967 or whatever from when israel and jordan were under attack so that the base was a pretty much a crap hole so you're just oh, was it? you know so that was azraq wasn't it yeah I think, yeah yeah which is a 
Jordanian uh, F-16 base, but we didn't even, we didn't even work with those guys or anything. So uh, we were in a tent city and we were, all the pilots were in trailers. So we had two guys and I could reach out and touch my roommates, bed almost. So you had to really get along with your buddies for the most part. You mentioned, Ned, the 10,000 foot ROE. Um, that was serious, wasn't it? I, I've got this recollection now. It is, as you just described, a very old recollection. But did some of you guys get grounded for going below that? Or am, I, am I imagining that? Or was there some groundings because pe- people. Yeah, didn't get there was. That? There was some. I, I wasn't grounded. Um, and I wasn't grounded from going below 10,000 feet with Wolfman later on. Um, but. You know, everyone's trying to be, you know, they're leaning forward, wanting to participate in the war to the max extent possible. And so I think guys were getting frustrated when they're bringing their bombs back. And so then they find a target on the ground, like some pickup trucks, and they start rolling in and, you know, comes like a uh, going to the range, bombing range kind of mission. You're just out there planking pickup trucks. There were enemy targets, but they were not high value enemy targets. And we were short um, bombs and fuses and gas. And we were single fuse on on our bombs because we didn't have enough fuses. So, uh, I, you know, one night I was in a kill box and they gave me uncontrolled strikes on military equipment. And so I was going to find something. I found some artillery. I hit it. The bomb dead it because it single, had a single fuse came back around, the next bomb worked, and it was right next to a uh, ammo storage. It was all underneath like a camoed area, and that whole thing went up like the 4th of July. It was, that was probably one of the coolest missions I've done. Because then my wingman said, can I, drop a, can I drop my bomb into the middle of that? I go, yeah. So he dropped his JDAM into that thing. So anyway, I mean, it was, that was, and, you know, we, we were shot at by missiles in AAA, so I'm sitting here going, yeah, that was a fun mission, but it was a satisfying mission, um, as opposed to the one with Wolfman, which was a totally different mindset. But just before we get into that, so so the 10,000-foot the thing is relevant because, obviously, as you've already described. Oh, yeah. You, we, you, yeah, so you, you're going you, below, and if you that. did, you were you, – we had guys getting grounded. Yeah. Um, and what about the threats then? Um, and again, this is relevant because I know you, you'll just, you'll describe what happened in, in this particular source. But what what were you being, you know, up until the 30th, what were the Iraqis fielding? What threat systems were you flying against? They had, uh, they, you know, they had some ZSU-23-4. Uh, they had some Roland missiles. They were really worried about SA-6s. Hmm. And they had a lot of, but I don't know if, we ever encountered any of those they had uh man pads um you know just shoulder mounted stuff and small arms fire um i can't remember any other systems i mean i'm, I'm sure there is i, f- I forgot uh, there was some AAA that could reach us up pretty high we were worried about um i'd have to go look through my notes on that hmm. um the exact but yeah there were there were threats and that was a, you know, a big, not, I wouldn't say over concern, but, you know, I think a lot of their SAM, the SAMs I did see launched were not guided. So, and their AAA was a lot of times barrage fire. So you, you could easily avoid it. So, um, but you know, we had some guys have it go right over their canopies, you know, and got their attention many times. Right. So it depended on what was going on. Just, just lastly, then I suppose you, you as an aviator, could classify it as a threat, but but you mentioned weather already. But um, what what was generally happening weather wise out there? Was it um, generally bad? Well, at that time of year, it was still pretty cold for us. I mean, we're wearing our jackets and everything. Uh, we had the heat on, uh, so it wasn't hot. Um, we had a lot of sandstorms roll in, and it. You know, the whole desert was down for several days because of that. And, um, you know, you get the typical, you know, cumulus kind of clouds with sand um, down below, just a milk bowl where you can't really see her on the horizon. And um, it, 
like the night with Wolfman, we didn't have any, we didn't have the moon. The moon really helped out at night with the MVGs. The moon is like the sun and even stars and stuff kind of help you stay oriented because you can see the stars and you can, you know, here's the moon over here, which is blinding you uh, with MVGs. But when there's no moon and then there's an overcast and there's no stars and then you got this milk bowl haze and sand, like a sand, you know, the sandstorm with winds and stirring up the desert. I mean, you're, you're blinded. Your, your MVGs are just green. There's nothing to see. They're, they're actually, it's almost like you should take them off at some point because you're, it's easy to get spatial disorientation when they're not providing any, any means to stay oriented. And our cockpit lighting had to be changed when the MVGs came about. So they had MVG lighting. So we didn't get any interference from that per se, but you still had to have all your lights down low if you're trying to look for like an IR strobe because you didn't want any interference with, you know, you wanted to have every best opportunity to find um, a strobe on the ground, for example, IR strobe. Do, so. do, do you want to talk us through the mission then? Sure. Um, it started out with where a sandstorm has been going on for a day or so. And so it's like, why are we even going to brief? Are we even going to go? So Wolfman and I just had that attitude of like, we're just going to be droning tonight for six hours, you know, go hit the tanker, go out there, drone around in a kill box. We wouldn't be able to see the ground. And but we were told, yeah, you're still going because we want a presence over Iraq. We don't want to ground our fleet because we want them to see airplanes up there. So we said, okay, that's what we're doing. So we take off into this weather and we go to the tanker. And typically when you get on the tanker, you're supposed to take your MVGs off and you just flip them up. And then, then it's just like regular nighttime air refueling, you know, you got lights and so forth, uh, director lights, and you can see the tankers lights. And so this night though, I wore my MVGs all the way to the, the tanker. Cause I couldn't see the tanker until I was right there approaching the boom. Well, now when you get close with the MVGs, it's disorienting cause you're like, it's, it's, it doesn't match up. So now you're having to look under your MVGs, but it's like, I'm not taking my MVGs off because if I lose the tanker, I need my MVGs to, you know, to, to try to stay on the tanker, you know, not losing because if I do lose them, I'm not going to find them again, probably. So yeah, you use your radar when you're coming in and we came in slowly. And so now I'm, I'm on the tanker looking underneath and that's hard to do. So your head is tilted back as you're trying to refuel. So we go through that and that's very stressful. And so we leave the tanker. And of course the tankers lights out, they wouldn't turn on their lights at all or anything. So we're just, you know, and, and when you, when you're in the tanker track, you're supposed to have your, your lights on. And then when you left, you could go covert and covert lighting uh, on our jets was something new as well. And you can see like, typically the flight lead will have his lights set to like one flash and it's an IR strobe. So the wingman can go, yeah, that's lead over there. But like Wolfman had his lights completely off. So I, I could never see him with my MVGs. Um, I could see him if he flared and he was close enough. But um, so typically the wingman wouldn't even have their lights on. Well, when you left the tanker track, a lot of times you see guys coming back from you know, a B1 or, or some S16s and they forgot to turn the lights on and you're just doing a you know, Thunderbird pass. So they, I'm, I'm surprised they didn't run airplanes together. And again, the, the saddle system worked up with Link 16, which was a, a system where you could see all the players. Um, so you could see your tanker and you just have to match up what track number they were to what you were seeing. So you, that's how you confirm you're on the right tanker by using our saddle and Link 16 system combined together. 
So anyway, so we left the tanker. Uh, we climbed up above the weather where we could, you know, see each other and you can see the stars. The moon still went out. But anyway, we're just kind of max relaxed. We're just going to go up here to a kill box south of al Qaim, which is in western Iraq, right along the Euphrates River. And out of the blue, we get this call from Bondo that it was a sprint. And the sprint was a code word for troops being overrun or it's a desperate situation. So kind of like all, all rules are out the, out the window at that point, technically. Um, so we're given a set of coordinates and they're way up north of al and They're outside of the area that we would even be have kill boxes. So it's up on the border of Syria and just south of Mosul. So we start heading to these point or this coordinates. And I got, you know, I just, I pushed it up and went as fast as I could. And, you know, the airplane is, is the configuration is already not stable because you have 2000 here and thousand pounds of bombs here. And, you know, you get up high about 0.95 and everything starts shaking and yawing and, so we're going as fast as we can. And we get overhead the point and all of a sudden the radio came alive because um, the guys on the ground were using guard, 243-0, that free, and, and, and the clear. So, you know, normally we were using uh, half quick radios, which, you know, they're cycling through their secret frequencies and then you get this clicking sound. And then we had, so the way we, we talk and the F-16 is uh, on UHF, we're talking to air traffic control, or we're talking to the AWACS, or we're talking to, you know, anyone outside of our flight. But interflight, we have an interflight frequency, so that's where we can talk to each other. Like, I don't have to be as formal on VHF as I have to be on UHF. UHF, I got to be call sign specific and so forth. On VHF, I could say, hey, Wolfman, check six or something. So when we were running in VHF, we were, we had secure radio, which had like a one second delay. But this night it's like, oh, we're not using secure radio because I can't, I can't, I need every possible nanosecond <laughs> to talk to my wingman. So we're in the clear on VHF with each other and we're on UHF with the special boat service guys, which we didn't know who they were at the time. I didn't even know until after we landed and did the research of who we had helped. Uh, they just, I knew they were, they were Brits or Australian by their voices. So we're on 243.0 and um, one of, prior to going to 243.0, um, one of the flights from our base um, had, was overhead already, but they didn't have the gas to help. So they said, hey, we're overhead. We're talking to these guys. They need your help. And, and so our, our call sign was Honcho 23. And they said, we're sending in Honcho 23. So we went over to the guard and it was just came alive with this, this guy on the radio who was hysterical. And, you know, when we play the, the video in a moment, um, you'll see that it's non-standard kind of calm with a guy calling for help. And so now we got to go down and help because there's no way that I could ethically not help, you know, now that I reflect on it. But at the time, it's like, you don't have time to think about ethics and whatever. You just think this is the right thing to do because this is who you are as a person. This is who you were brought up to be. Um, if someone is calling for help, this is what you're going to do. If it's like a kid was in a swimming pool drowning, you're not going to evaluate temperature of the water, if there's a snake, an alligator, or whatever in the water, you're going to go and jump in and save this kid because that's just what you do. And so that's the same kind of situation that we're in. You know, when I look back, I go, man, those guys really put us in a, in a hard spot. You know, they were really desperately needing help, but how can we provide help if we can't see them? And we got the, the sandstorm, we got to contend with. So, Nevertheless, we start heading down and, I'm, and Wolfman is back in like a uh, fighting wing kind of trail position. 
and he's using saddle to stay with me because he's not going to radar lock me because if he locks me with his radar now i got a radar warning receiving receiver warning that someone's locked to me and you don't want that um so we we don't have any idea we have no situational awareness and so as this pilot and as, as you know as a pilot situational awareness uh, when it's high everything is i mean you've got everything in order in your life you know, i mean you know what just happened what's happening now and what's going to happen in the future and you are already ahead if you're ahead of the jet you're executing ahead of the moment you know everyone says to be in the moment i'm like now you need to be ahead of the moment because when you're ahead of the moment you already are executing knowing what's going to happen so that situational awareness of which we didn't have i didn't know what the, the terrain was like I didn't know who we were helping. I didn't know what threats there were. I didn't know the lines of communication. I didn't know where the border was with Syria. I knew we were close. I'm, I'm using a stick map because that's how I operate. I, I got to keep it simple. I had, a, I had the, the mobs. That was my, I'm Lynch, so I'm Lynch mobs, uh, tactical map. And I had all the kill boxes on a little sheet of paper and I knew exactly. I was like, man, we're near Syria. But, you know, at this point, whatever. You know what I mean? And so uh, you're you're not going to overanalyze the bureaucracies, um, the rules at that point. At this point, now it becomes human to human, and these guys need our help. So we go down. Um, we're looking for their strobe because, as they said, I had an IR strobe, and. Uh, they're they're telling me that they've got they're surrounded and they got an enemy within 300 meters and to take everything out. I'm like, well, that's the best news I've heard in a long time. You want to give me permission? That's like a kid in a candy store that I can take everything out. Well, I, first of all, I got to find everything to take out. Well, I can't see everything. My targeting pod is all blanked out. Uh, we had a a, a, a laser finder that I means you found something on the ground you could shoot the laser at it and your wingman could see your jet like a star wars laser going to that point and he could direct his targeting pod to that area but you couldn't even use that so it came down to just basic almost manual bombing in your head like what can i do and it's like well if i can find your strobe i'm going to guess 300 meters you know when i got back and, uh, you know, we're we're not on the metric system. So when I got back and I'm like, well, that's inside the the um, the danger area of a Mark 82. If you drop it, I mean, within 300 meters of someone, they're going to feel the effects of it. But I took that chance that and the rules of engagement said that you had to have a positive ID. And of the target and so i'm going to go and have a positive id that i have a strobe and i'm going to bomb it for that and but at the time it's like that's what i'm going to do and so i would roll in trying to dive down and find their strobe and i would get so messed up in my head because i'm looking through a hud that's just you know green with my mbgs and so it, it became a challenge just with spatial disorientation. I mean, you're just doing unusual attitude recoveries and then you're back into turning and trying to help. And so you're, it's kind of almost like a panic mode with these guys calling that now you feel that you need to help right now. And after several times of trying to roll in and getting myself messed up spatially, and Wolfman's trying to stay with me. I left the target area and went about 10 miles out and, and came up with, okay, I think I'm going to do, I'm going to try to do what I did back when I flew block 40 F-16s. And we had a tactic where we would, we would fly. The, yeah, I got an F-16 right here. We'd fly in straight and level, and then we'd bunt the airplane. So you're light in the seat to about 30 degrees nose low. And this is using the FLIR pod back then. We didn't have MBGs in the lot 40. So you're using a FLIR, and you just bunt and 
you're on a 30 degree dot path and you uh, would switch over to CCIP, which is just a, a man, not manual bombing, but it's manually pickling and the bomb's going to come off. You're, the, CCC, the CCIP, continuous computing impact point, pepper is a death dot. So once you had the target, then you'd switch over to that, drop, recover, and you're out of there. So it's a more controlled situation, especially in the weather. And if you're trying to turn in the weather and, you know, maneuver around, you, I mean, that's where you get yourself mixed up in the F-16 because we don't have a canopy bow um, to help us. I mean, people get spatial disoriented in the F-16 on a clear night, mm. much less in the weather, especially if everything's reflecting and off the canopy because you got this bubble canopy and everything's reflecting on it. So to combat that, I turned off all my lights. I just turned everything off. I turned the HUD down as low as I could get it. Um, and then I had a little eyebrow light that I had shining on my attitude indicator. And so my attitude indicator became my life. That's my lifeline. Hmm. And I'm trying to ask Wolfman what the min altitude of the Mark 82 is. I couldn't remember. I just, he said, don't worry. Don't worry. I'm, I'm watching you. Um, so I knew he was backing me up. So, I was going to press as low as, as I could. I didn't know what my altitude was. And I had Ditch and Betty set up higher. So Ditch and Betty's going off saying altitude, altitude, altitude the whole time. And I, I, I can't even tell what my altitude is. So I'm pressing down. And I did this several times um, with Wolfman just backing me up. And I'm looking for the strobe. And every time I would, you know, Wolfman say, check altitude. I go, I don't know what altitude is. And I just pull. And on one of the one of the times I looked down, I saw the strobe and Wolfman was back about a couple of miles and he had the ability to keep uh, contact on the strobe. So I passed him a tactical lead and he rolled in and dropped a Mark 80, Mark 82, which is a, it was a GB 12 unguided. So it's just basically dropping a Mark 82 on an unknown spot next to the strobe. which is not what they've wanted to watch back at the base. <laughs> Nevertheless, the outcome of this whole big chocolate mess is that 52 special ops guys from the UK, special boat servers, badasses um, from M squadron, according to the um, Bravo six zero book. Uh, I mean, they all survived. Okay. And they were dispersed all over different areas. And, and the team I was talking to was surrounded in a desperate situation because I had another guy who was calm, cool, and collective on the radio too. And he was interfering, but they couldn't hear each other. So I, I forgot to say that while I go. When we're up here, you know, it's almost, I call it mothballing because you're like a moth around a light. You're, you get sucked into the target area. And that's where you can get shot down in close air support missions and, a reason that we don't fly over the target and circle it, circle around too much. You, you usually are standoff or like a figure eight pattern where you can maneuver and just look toward the target area. Of course, you couldn't do that that night. Um, so I'm mothballing over the target and I got one guy, it's calm, cool, and collected. And I got one guy calling for help and they're stepping on each other. So the coordination was difficult. And uh, I, it's the worst place I've ever been because you basically surrendered to that battle. You surrendered to that moment. You gave up your life because you know, this is an impossible situation to deal with, but you're going to, but you got to do something. So, um, you know, Wolfman dropping a bomb is, was the right thing to do. I mean, I was going to drop, probably closer than 300 meters because I, I basically was going to put the strobe just on the edge of my, just outside the pepper, the mm -hmm. circle. And so it would have had really close. And uh, I mean, we could have killed, had some friendly fire that night. So I know that God was protecting me there. 
you know, protecting lives on the ground and protecting my career, protecting us. Um, so during all this maneuvering and doing all these uh, unusual attitude recoveries and these pa- high speed passes we're doing and we're in and out of afterburner. And we were also, well, when Wolfbang came off this attack, put out flares and I go, hey, that's a good idea. So I came around and put out some flares um, on, on, my, on some of my passes. So um, I got back and my roommate's like, you put flares out of that highlight channel? Like, hey, you know, flares, the noise, all that in the debrief I found out really worked. At the time, it was just like, okay, we're going to give them something. Um, you know, we gave them one bomb, we gave them flares, we gave them noise. And while I'm maneuvering up there, I got a missile launch warning. So um, when you get a missile launch warning, you're in the weather and I was slow because I'd been in this turn, I'm at 250 knots. And I'm up in the teen, so all I can do is roll and push and get speed up and and do a, a kind of a glib maneuver, um, which is where you roll upside down and pull about 45 degrees and as well accelerate, come back up, and you're just doing these these uh, you know aggressive maneuvers. And so I'm in full afterburner. I'm putting out flares. And when you put flares out wearing MVGs in the weather, it blinds you. It's just boom. You know, you get this. It's actually a, an effect that comes from behind you. It's like a this light. It's, a, it's really a cool effect when you're in peacetime doing it. But in a combat, you're like, holy cow. You know, you're like, I just, I just made it more difficult for me to fly my own airplane using a self-protection device or protection um, flares. Um, So after all this, everything calmed down and we're almost out of gas and I can't get a hold of them anymore. So, uh, and then a uh, Slayer 5.5, I think, was an AC-130 coming in. Uh, and then uh, a Chinook helicopter came in afterwards and uh, these guys egressed. And so the AC-130 blew up all their stuff. And, you know, they're flying around. They got a big crew. They're not a single seat, single engine guy at night trying to maneuver in a fast moving jet. And I got to debrief with those guys years ago. And it's pretty cool to see how they're having to deal with the weather themselves and trying to find you know, find the equipment. And I don't think they got it all because I mean, there's reports out there that that the Iraqis got some of it, but who knows? Real story on that. But anyway, all these guys survived is the outcome, and um, we made it back. And you know, they put me in for a DFC for Valor, and so I got that. But Wolfman didn't get anything, and so I worked for a lot of years trying to get him a DFC for with Valor device, but. Um, they never would approve it, but they did give us the Aviation Valor Award and the Semper Viper Award, which came from Lockheed. But you know, awards don't really—they're you know—that's nice to have on the shelf. And you're—I love me room or whatever. But no one comes up here anyway. But me, this only helps motivate me to go. Yeah, you know, you did something in the past. You keep working hard and do something in the future. You know, it's only to motivate yourself to keep going and to work hard as you get older. And um, so, you know, I'm honored. But the best thing is that you made it back home to your family. So I think it, this would be a good time to play the tape because I know everyone's wanting to know, like, really, you know, what what did this sound like? And this is a, you know, I... I got lucky that I had access to my tapes for a little bit and I, I was able to make some clips. And so these are a variety of clips, you know, not to make it a boring two minutes. This is probably 10 different clips pieced together. Oh, 
Sancho 23, we're eight miles out from those coordinates. Get a five, uh, rocket on. It's spirit rate, spirit rate! We have got them totally around us within 300 meters! Get a five, you got a strobe on when you're in the Two clear trail to go down lower. Speed, it's speed! Vader 05, Vader 05, this is Honcho 23 on guard. I'm overhead your position, descending down through the weather. I need to get a talk on. Do a second, do you need a roger that? From our strobe, we are talking north, north. We have lights approaching this location. Our position has turned out a light over. Fuck. From the north, can you confirm? Altitude. Altitude. 10,000 feet if I were... Lights on, strobe lights on. Disregard. You press, I'm, I'm keeping an eye on you. Altitude. Altitude. Okay, turn your strobe on now. Strobe on now. Altitude. Our strobe is on for our position. Altitude. 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 I'm not seeing anything. Turn it on. Transmitting on guard. You got a sprint in progress on guard. Turn your strobe on. Altitude. Check out two. Altitude. Roping, roping opposition. Hot two three, I have no strobe, I have no strobe, I can't help you if I can't see you. One bomb away, we're covering. Shaft, flare. Roger, Vigil, you're on Yeah, we're covering. Good flares, good flares. Roger, Vigil, you're on That's my chat. We're there for about... Um... Half an hour, wow. and rooting around trying to help, and you you feel you feel like you're you failed honestly because you you're working trying to get a bomb off, you're trying to find them, and so you leave there wondering, uh, you know, did I leave these guys out? You know, did, you know, yeah, we made some noise, put some flares out, and <clears throat> with man got a bomb off, but. At that point, I have no idea. I'm thinking they're all going to die or they're, you know, by the time I get back. And so now, you know, you, you feel this, you, you know, just overcome with this fear of that. And, you know, the whole way home, you're just it's like in a dream state, you know, wondering. And so then, you know, it took a couple of days before the intel flowed back to where we found out these guys survived. And then a couple of years later, right before I interviewed with you, I got the interview. I got the, I just happened to be based at a special ops base where 
these guys were coming in to do some training from the UK. And so I got to, I got to meet them. I, I yeah. did two of them, you know, and they gave me a plaque, which is up there. Special, special boat service plaque. I see. You know? it, yeah. And, and, um, that that's, that's probably the coolest thing I have on my wall up here. No one would know that, you know, to me it is. And, um, anyway, I, you know, we went, we went down into the storm and we tried to help. And so that's, and we highlighted ourselves by flaring and yeah, we broke the ROE by the altitude and dropping a bomb on, without a positive ID. And I was the flight lead responsible for that, even though I didn't drop the bomb. Um, you know, I, but I was rewarded in the end, you know, um, and I'm honored to receive the accolades and so forth, but um, it doesn't mean that, you know, that you don't still wonder what you could have done better that night. And, uh, you know, because of that, there was such a sting to leave that battle scene, not knowing the outcome that that sting is like still a wound that, doesn't go away, you know, mentally, because you, you feel that you left those guys when they needed you the most, you know, although you, you had to perform when it counted. And I believe that we did all that we could do. Um, and of course they're probably wondering why couldn't you do more? You know, you know, I thought you were an advanced S 16. I mean, the S 16 is a designed to be a daytime, you know, fighter that could turn up his ass, not uh, dropping bombs and at night in a sandstorm in Iraq, you know? So. Well, that, uh, I mean, that, that's an interesting point, isn't it? There's, I mean, there are lots of questions in my mind. If, if you've got time, we'll go through. But, yeah. but let's start with that one then. So what did those guys, uh, those SBS guys, when you met them a few years later, what did they say to you from their point of view? I, I'm curious to know if they were, talkative about it if if it was just you know a meet and greet and to say thank you to you or if you shared recollections of that that night we you know it's been such a long time ago i mean we we got together and it was a lot of thanks and that kind of stuff and you know i i showed them my tapes what i just showed you and um and we got to debrief and just see on a map how they were dispersed because i thought they were all together um and and then the zero six bravo book um, you know, brought light to their mission and what they were doing and how they, you know, were having to fight a force, uh, you know, thousand, I think it was a hundred thousand, yeah, thousands yeah. of guys. I mean, a division yeah. of troops and they're just, it was a bad situation that they kind of handed a shit sandwich. And that's what my commander later said when he watched all the tapes, he goes, his Ned, he goes, man, you guys are handed a shit sandwich. I mean, we did what we could do with what we had available. And like I said, I, I honestly think all the prayers anyone's ever said for me, that's, that came to fruition that night. You know, that was where God was protecting us and the SBS guys. For, and I believe the story can be used as a way to honor God in that way too. Um, just on 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 that then, and the theme of self sacrifice, which you you mentioned right at the beginning when you were telling the story of this mission, you'd said you sort of I can't remember exactly how you said it, but it was something along the lines of you you get to a point where you're sort of then really putting your own life on the line, um, yeah, to help these guys. Do, was there? A, I don't want to put words into your mouth, but was there a part of you that was thinking you might not go home? Yeah, you might end up yeah. Oh, yeah. The I, that definitely. And it was like when we, when I pushed forward and started descending, it was like, I said in my mind, I'm sorry to my family. I said, I'm sorry, guys. Sorry. And I have to go do this. But I have to. And, um, previous, <clears throat> when we first, right before we fenced in, or probably right after we fenced in on the border of Iraq, and it's 
it's kind of the, the boring moment of the sortie because you don't know this, this is on the horizon. And, you know, you got the Big Dipper up there. And so the Big Dipper is on the ceiling of my daughter's um, bedroom. So it's always, every time I see the Big Dipper, I think about my daughter, you know, I've got three kids, but the youngest one at the time, you know, she was still at that age where things were, you know, you're decorating the room with all kinds of things like Big Dipper. And so um, I had actually, I snuck a cell phone over there. (laughs) I had a T-Mobile cell phone that I bought that had the world plan and the base was right next to highway 10 from Amman to Baghdad. So it, cell phone coverage was good. And so I'm caught, everyone's lining up to make a 10 minute phone call home once a week. And I'm like calling home every day. <laughs> <laughs> so right before we stepped, I got a call from my wife and someone talking to my daughter. She's like, she was crying. She wanted to, she wanted to kiss good night. And so I was like, I, I can't, daddy can't right now. I'll, I'll be home soon, you know? So, I mean, that's a human factor when you're stepping to fly a combat mission and you've got this kind of, you know, homesick feeling because you just talk to your family and you got a kid crying for a good night kiss. Mm. So, you know, then I'm up there and I see the big dipper and then I'm over this battle saying, you know, I'm, I'm 40 years old at the time and I'm an airline pilot. I mean, and now I'm saying goodbye to my family and my mind that I got to go down and help these guys because it's a combat situation Mm. that needs to be handled. And so it was, um, it was very uneasy feeling, but it was also freeing as well because it's like, okay, I'm we're in it now. It doesn't, at this point, it doesn't matter if you live or die. I mean, you're going to, you're going to do whatever you can. Mm-hmm. You're not, you're not thinking about dying or, or, or living. You're just performing and the outcome is already, it's in your mind. It's the outcome for your own self doesn't matter at that point because you've freed yourself from that. And this is, this is deep stuff, man. You know, just trying to reflect on that and understand it. I think that's the reason I went back and got a sports psychology degree is trying to understand performance Mm -hmm. and how you perform and your, how your mind works. And so, you know, how does elite athlete perform, you know, when others can't. And I think, that as an F-16 pilot or any fighter pilot, um, and I know right now Top Gun's out and it's real popular and fighter pilots are in the limelight, it's you're an elite athlete in an airplane because you're expected to physically perform because it's a 9G capable airplane and we pull 9Gs a lot and you've got to mentally perform and then you've you know, there's a spiritual component too, which is you know, combined with your faith and belief system, your emotions and your family situation and how all that intertwines. I mean, a lot of human factors. And then this airplane has killed a lot of people just in the daytime with spatial disorientation or uh, in, in peacetime. And here we are in the, we were outside of the, con, we were outside of radio contact with Bondo, the AWACS. So we were alone, the two of us. Yeah, we had someone yelling out at some guard. I don't know. That must have been maybe some eight, ten guys or somebody who were nearby, but we were the only two assets in that area. And we, so we had no contact with the man in control. We were too far away from the base to ever talk to them. So we're alone by ourselves, just two guys from Alabama. And you're jumping in the, Jumping into the mix, you're jumping into the the frying pan and do what you can. So yeah, no one's ever asked me that deep feeling, but yeah, it's it's a surrender. Is one way I I think I said it earlier. It's a surrender to the battle, a surrender to that moment. But um, you know, I never. 
you know, I forgot exactly my words while I go. I need to go back and watch it and write those down because that's exactly, I mean, that you pull that out of me from deep within, you know, about that. It's a free, you're free at that point mm -hmm. to operate. And until you do that, then you're going to be maybe holding back and not giving, giving your all. You're protecting, you're protecting that. And how do you uh, no, it's not even... suicide per se and it's not like a kamikaze per se which i think dropping nukes would be more of a kamikaze kind of thing because we had to surrender to that and the f-111 um because you didn't have to make it home from there you only had to make it past the target 10 miles so maybe all these combined things from the past knowing that i had surrendered to dropping a nuke on the ussr because we go out and exercise the mindset of that. And you had to tell your commander that you were well ready and willing and able to die to drop a nuke. So now you maybe, you know, subconsciously your your mind is operating that way. But yeah, it's a freeing, it's you're free at that point to operate. So Anyway, I, I interrupted you. I'm sorry. No, no, I interrupted you. No, it's okay. I mean, this is that—that that was actually the exact question I was going to ask you, which was whether you had, you know, previously experienced those same moments, uh, emotions, and sort of spiritual um, sort of reckoning in, in terms of your life as a, a fast jet aviator initially Wizzo in the the f-111 and then later at, at 16 because it's a notoriously dangerous business anyway so i, I wondered it, it's interesting to hear you say you, you talk to your daughter and you had this emotional connection with the big dipper some some guys i talked to when they deployed they shut it all off they you know the curtains come down the family stays at home i'm now here to do this job and and it's interesting there there are different approaches and what works for you if it works for you, that's great. If it works doesn't work for someone else, they can they can do their own thing. But I was just wonder whether or not, you know, you had some level of conditioning to that surrender prior to going to Iraq in two thousand or three and three, or whether or not actually because you were a family man when you went there and, and I'm guessing you were single when you were flying the F one eleven, whether or not those two things made a difference. Yeah, I was I wasn't single, but I, I it was my first wife and so my second wife, her husband was an F-16 pilot and he died of cancer. And so when I took over for, I took over for his kids basically as a step-in dad. So it's where my kids are from him. And so I've always felt that I was, you know, they were special kids because they had lost their dad and now I have to fill his shoes. I'm responsible for that. And then we have one kid together and now she was, I was, you know, my biggest fear was that she would never know if I died over there in Iraq, that she would never remember me, you know, because she was too young to have those memories possibly. And, and so I don't know, all those things combine together, possibly. I've never really thought about, you know, the conditioning of dropping nukes, but maybe that's already inbred and then the you know you that i went through rtc air force rtc back in the 80s and that was very it was during the cold war and it was a very patriotic time in america with ronald reagan and so you know you were patted on the back for wanting to fly jets in the air force and and be part of the cold war and, and go possibly drop a nuke on Russia. You know what I mean? You were, mm. you were, it was a patriotic time as, and, and then things have changed, you know, after nine 11 things were, there was a lot of flag waving going on then too, which is needed for the war effort, obviously, because if you don't have that, you're not going to go give your best effort. I mean, you're going to, you're going to, you know, it's just like any athlete, you know, when you got fans in the stands, it's going to be different than if it was empty. And you need those, you need that support. Um, so all that stuff combined, Steve, I guess, is it's what I'm trying to say. It's, you know, in the moment, you don't have time to think about it either. But 
I, I can't see how someone can totally pull down the curtain when they go to the war because for one, I mean, you get an email every day and then, not, you know, you can call home. I got a cell phone. Um, I mean, you still, I mean, and, you know, as an Air National Guard pilot, you, you've got a, you're a professional, you know, airline pilot. So you're on leave from them and you've, you know, you've got to, um, you're representing them too, in a way. And yet I was, I was furloughed during the war. So now I'm a little, <laughs> I, you know, I'm, I'm not a very happy man at that point either. It's like, I wanted to, you know, there's vengeance, you know, that I wanted to inflict on Iraq based on my employer. Yeah. So, you know, you know, cause you, you know, you're, you're, um, it's not a good place to be to lose your job while you're in combat mm -hmm. because of the war that you're actually fighting. Not because of you and the war, but because of the war itself and the economic situation and mm -hmm. force majeure, they call it French term, I guess, for we're going to lay you off, mm -hmm. you know, the contracts out the window kind of thing because of war. So, um, and you're over there doing your best effort to protect, to do the mission that the air force has assigned you to do, which is coming from the national command authority, which is all and a bigger picture thing. I mean, it's all part of a plan that we don't know about. We're just executing our little small part of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. And then the part that we're executing is so narrow and it's just one little small fragment on the fabric of the whole system and the whole war. Um, and there's so many stories like this, I'm sure that are just as good or better, mm. you know, that people have risked their lives and surrendered and, um, said goodbye to their families and their mind to go and execute, mm. you know, and it's, um, it's something that they don't train you for. It's something that is, you experientially learn. And I don't know. If I had a way of dealing with it, I'd say that I prayed every day and I read the Bible every day and I had other people praying and I just had to trust that God would direct my hands in battle and direct my feet every day. And so if you surrender to that, you know, what more can you do in life? You know, I mean, that's the ultimate highest, you know, thing because you, you're, you, have assurance of the outcome, no matter what it is on earth, you have an outcome that you know that you have faith that you, you will continue on, you know? Mm. And, and so that in itself is a freeing um, part of combat too. You know, you've freed yourself from the ultimate outcome and knowing that, that you have assurance of salvation, you know? Mm. So, I mean, I, I said right at the beginning. You, you mentioned Wolf time, Wolfman a couple of times. I said right at the beginning. He tragically he was uh, killed a few years after I met him um, in, a, in a car accident. And obviously, I'd like to think that if he were alive today, he'd be joining us for this conversation. Yeah. And, and sort of in his absence, I, I looked over my interview with him, and, and one of the things he had said was that every time he thinks about this mission, the hair stand up on the back of his neck, and every time he hears that shrill voice, you know, saying we're surrounded you know, kill everything within 300 meters, um, you know, it brings it all back to him. Do you think, I'm asking you to speak for him, which is not necessarily fair on you, but do, do you think, um, you know, he was similarly impacted by that particular mission? Did you guys talk to each other about it afterwards as sort of brothers in arms and, and share your, because obviously it's emotional for you. It's not, you know, this is not just an ordinary event. This is something you said right at the beginning, you think, well, there's very few days or no days go by when you don't think about it. Um, and it's, it's a raw wound, I think you, you described it as. But did you share that with him? Um, you know, today we talk a lot about post-traumatic stress disorder and, you know, maybe back in the day there was some stigma associated with that and now it's, you know, get people talking is the thing to do. But We, we never talked about it, like, deeply, like we're talking about it now. We never did. We, 
it it made us uh, on a different level of friendship. You could just tell, you could tell by the handshake, the look in your eye when you, you know, when I would see him when we go fly again, or, I, you know, I, I stayed in the guard for another six months before I went back on active duty. And so I would see him occasionally and flew with him every once in a while. And, you know, we took pictures together by the jets, um, not right after the mission, but later, you know, like several months after we got back. Um, and he came to my, he was in my, yeah, he was one of the guys in my Finney flight in the Alabama guard before I went back on active duty. And so, you know, it, it was more of a bonding thing than having these deep discussions of how you felt, because I think we tend to, to compartmentalize those deep emotions that we don't like to share as, as men, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, you possibly think it's a weakness, but I look at, I look back at it as now as something that is, gives me strength. Um, maybe at the time right afterwards, cause I didn't have a whole lot of time with him before. Cause I went back on active duty and I didn't see him that much. And then he was in his car crash and you know, and that's tragic in itself because he had a Corvette and he slid off the road and he was trapped and people video that oh, instead okay. of jumping in. And so I, I did, I did a, uh, I did a briefing at Maxwell Air Force Base a few years ago at the Air Command and Staff College had me in like 600 people out there. And I went through this tape just like we did today. And I brought up Wolfman and I was like, Hey, if you're driving home today and someone goes off the road are you going to go out and video it or are you going to jump into the fire and help you know and it was like this situation in iraq was we jumped in and helped we didn't sit there and just stay up above and video and make recordings of them calling for help we went in there and did something and I, and no one went in and did that same for wolf and that you know that still bothers me i'm sitting here tapping my hands and stuff because i i mean i can feel the emotions running through me now you know why didn't someone help? It was on the news from a video camera or, you know, cell phone camera. So um, I wish I could have had those discussions with him now. He'd probably feel the same as me, I'm sure. I have visited his, his grave. I passed it's up north of Atlanta. It's at a, a veteran, a national military uh um, you know, graveyard. Uh, and so I went there and, uh, you know, put a nickel on the grass, save a pilot, save a Friday pilot's ass. So yeah, he still lives in our hearts. That's for sure. Hmm. Did, did the, um, the experience, I mean, all the whole experience in Iraq, but, but this particular, this particular one, did it, it, did it affect you? So obviously it's, uh, sort of emotionally and spiritually had an impact. Did it have an impact on you as an F-16 pilot? Did you, when you went back to after, I can't remember if when you went back to after duty, you were flying in a flying billet, but, but you know, do you operate the airplane differently? Did you make decisions, you know, preempt decisions in your head as to if you ever went back to combat and that kind of thing happened again, you would do things a certain way. Um, what, what was the bearing on your professional uh, persona? Yeah. When I went back, I did a staff job from, for a few years, which I hated. I hate sitting at the desk. And so then I went out to Davis Monthan, this Tucson, Arizona, to 12th Air Force. I was a flight safety guy. So I went back to Luke Air Force Base, went through the TX course, which is the short course. And I, you know, I was a lieutenant colonel at that time. And I'm going through with these young captains, and I'm just I, I don't know if it affected the way I flew, but it affected the way that I just analyzed like, okay, you know, one day maybe you'll see, hmm. or even people I know at flew in combat. I go, okay, well, you haven't had that mission yet that got your attention. Cause it's not like you really ever want to go back and do it again. <laughs> it's like, okay, I've been there, done that. All right. Next. It's like, 
and you know, it's someone's like, I've heard a few people like, oh man, I really, really wish we could go back and, you know, do it again and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, I mean, man, I'm, that, it, that impacted me so much that it's like, no, I don't want to ever want to go to combat again. Mm-hmm. I've been there, done that. And that's, you know, that, that's enough for me. I mean, if I was called upon to do it, yes. You know, just like you were called, I was called upon to go down and help in a storm. Yeah, you would obviously do that for your country. But it's not like you want to go do that. Hmm. You know, it's not like a, it's not something you look back on and it's like, oh yeah, that was, that was a good adrenaline rush. I'd really love to have that happen again. No, it's like, no, I'm, I'm completely satisfied with the experience I had. I'm, I've had my combat experience. And if I had one mission and that's the only one I ever did, that, that would be, you know, enough for me. That way. So your, your daughter now would be 20 or so, I guess. I'd imagine 20 or so. Um, do, have you shared the tape with her? Have you, have you talked through the experience with her? Is that is something you've done? Yeah, she's 23, and when this story came out on the Smithsonian Channel, she was in college, and so she or actually came out in 2016. So a few years later in college, you know, she she's like, you know, she thought it was really cool because she's a journalist mate. She majored in journalism, so she was she can analyze it differently and um. But I never have sat down with her and said, okay, let me tell you about blah, blah, blah. It was like, it, I let her, you know, find her own way to that story. Hmm. But I have shared with her, I wrote a poem for her that was about that night with the Big Dipper. Wow. So I, you know, she she definitely knows about the mission and, and she's watched the tape and she's seen the Smithsonian Channel Air Warrior show which actually is on two episodes of it now. And they're all slightly different, but I'm honored that they, they liked the story and they wanted to use it to, you know, for their show. And uh, I don't get any money or royalties or anything that they pay for my hotel. That was it. And the flight <laughs> up there. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned, it. I mean, actually, so to be clear, I don't make any money out of this. Either. This is, this is loss making um, much to my chagrin, but, but so, so I'm glad you mentioned it because um, for anybody who has watched that show, and I'll be careful how I phrase this, anybody who's watched that show or read the book, uh, the Damien Lewis book, written from the SBS's perspective, he's a journalist, uh, so I'm guessing he was writing it based on interviews with some of the members of M Squadron, I think it was, and SBS, which was a combination of special boat service and special air service guys. I think there's a strong sort of emphasis on supersonic passes and things like that, Um and there's some missing detail around the GBU-12 being dropped and, and so on. So just for anybody who's listening and thinks since there's a disconnect, I think uh, maybe they had an editorial view that they wanted to tell a particular story. But what Ned's telling here today, as you've just heard by listening to the tapes themselves, is what actually happened. Um, and similarly, my I, I wrote in my book an unedited version of what Wolf, uh, Wolf, Wolfman and, and Ned have both said to me. So... Um, if anyone's curious as to why there's a disconnect, then that's probably down to an editorial decision on the Smithsonian's part. It's probably fair to say. Yeah, and you know, there the show is about the F-16, not about us, and so it's about the F-16's capabilities and so forth. Now, you know, high-speed F-16s make a lot of noise, and the airflow out of a F-16. If you see an F-16 take off in full afterburner, you can see the supersonic shock wave. Uh, you can see the little diamonds in the in the afterburner flame. And that, what I've been told, that's the supersonic yeah. shock wave. Yeah. And so when you have an F-16 that is, well, for example, um, after 9-11, I, we were sitting alert and we got, um, tasked to go and intercept a little small airplane down in Ocala, Florida. And we're in, you know, 500 miles away or whatever. And so we, we got permission to go supersonic over land. So we're just hauling ass and, you know, we got a lot of gas to burn. And so we intercept this guy at about 3000 feet above the ground. 
and we're in, we're still fairly heavy weight. We've got two tanks of gas that we're trying to burn up and we burn most of that down. And so me and um, this guy named Yader, Kevin Yader, we're, um, we're kind of Chuck. We're like across the circle from each other. And we got this little bug smasher right in the middle of us <laughs> and we're in full AD. So we go around and this guy lands and there's like a thousand cops down there that, you know, go surround this guy. So we fly back to Tyndall and land and we're on the news that all the schools are in lockdown for this incident. Because I mean, we're overhead and full afterburn. So two F-16s and afterburner at down at low altitude. I'm not talking down at a hundred feet altitude. I'm just talking at three or 4,000 feet above the ground. Hmm. I mean, I was my, I've off the record. I've, I've flown over my hometown a few times. It just happened to be on the route we were going. I don't know how that happened, you know, de- planning details. And so <laughs> my wingman was going in and out of burner. And my mom's like on the phone with me afterwards. She goes, what was that exploding sound? I'm like, Oh, that was my wingman going in and out of burner. So, I, and, and it, at another time, my wife said that, you know, the neighbor's baby was crying. <laughs> and, you know, we set car alarms off. So you, if you could set a car alarm off, you got a baby crying, you got this exploding sound. I knew that after Werner, it makes a lot of noise from the S-16. I mean, it's a powerful engine, you know, hmm. 28,000 pounds of thrust or whatever in that, that little engine. So you've got that going on. You got the, the sound of our airplanes, just the noise it makes, just the airflow of her. And we're, you know, you're pushing the mock sometimes and you're, you know, um, parts of the airplane are already going supersonic hmm. at that point. And I don't know, I don't have all the tapes. So I, you know, there, um, you know, when you drop a bomb, there's a supersonic shock wave off of that too, guarantee you. So you got all that combined. Um, and, uh, like Wolfman in his story, he said he saw lightning. I don't, I never saw lightning, but he did, you know, I mean, what you're seeing, you're so hyper-focused that every story is going to have parts that are different than someone else's story. So, you know, when you combine the stories, um, you know, you kind of get a bigger picture of what going on you know the sbs story is showing what they're going through our story our interview with you is telling you know what we're seeing and both ben and i seeing two different things at times mm. and then you've got the tapes and you've you know thankfully we have that because otherwise you wouldn't have much of a story without that i think you know now i i went no one would ever believe me this guy's calling for help like this yeah i have to get a copy of that audio is, I was that was a big goal of mine when I got back. I guess no one ever can no one would ever believe me that we we're helping these guys out. Mm-hmm. So um but yes, that I mean what I've said today, I mean what this is what we were doing. I mean we were I I never intended to, you know, my intention was to attack and drop a bomb and eliminate the problem or to provide an escape mechanism for them. Because I'm thinking you're surrounded. If I just drop a bomb, that's going to do something to disrupt the whole process. But, you know, I learned later that the noise, the flares, you know, especially the, the AB noise, and uh, which is supersonic airflow, is very effective. But at the time, I, all I want to do is kill. I got my fangs out, you know. I'm not up there wanting to be some peacekeeper who doesn't want to employ a weapon no the weapon was the that was the choice matter of fact i wanted to strafe as well i mean i even asked them do you want me to strafe a bomb they said we want a bomb i was like because i wanted to strafe i thought that would be effective or i mean if you even if you shot the gun at nothing the sound of that gun is sounds like a chainsaw that's you know, a supersonic chainsaw. I mean, cause those bullets are supersonic. Mm. And so, um, you know, I never got the chance to do that. I, yeah. Can I go back and do that? Please? Um, yeah, there's a lot of things I wish I could have done better, 
you know, I wish I would, I, you know, I'd gone down lower, had to have more of a stable platform. And, you know, now, you know, then the noise is effective. That would have been like, okay, we'll go down to, you know, as low as the altitude as I could possibly go. Hmm. But you didn't know that at the time, you're just trying to put a bomb on target, you know? And the outcome was, yeah, all this other this stuff is really cool. You know, and you got this uh, effect from the flares and from the noise and, and from the supersonic airflow off the wings or the engine. And so. it's it, it's not necessarily obvious, although you can hear it by the panting uh, on his breath, because he, initially they're vehicle mounted, aren't they? And then they dismount, leave the vehicles behind, and they're on foot. Um, but they're moving, so they're not in one place. So I was kind of thinking, well, you know, could there have been a technological element where they could data link something to you and you could, but I guess that would, I don't know if they had the capability, but if they're moving and they're just running for their lives, which it sounds like what yeah. they were doing, then that, all, all those options are out the window, aren't they, really? It's out the window. It's not, I mean, they could have given me some mensurated coordinates. I got to drop the JDAM on it. Hmm. But there's no way they could even provide that. I mean, the guy's just... And my understanding is he was a new TACP or tactical air control party guy. And now he's put in a bad situation, which is uncommon. And they're on the move trying to escape. And they're on like their um, quad bikes that they had. So, and then of course the other guy on the radio is calm and cool. Cause they're all separated by, you know, a lot of miles but I can pick them up because mm. we're just line of sight. And so, um, so, so do you know whose strobe it was that you saw then? Was it the, the sort of most pressured guy or the, the cooler sounding, calmer sounding guy? No, no idea. I don't know which strobe we were seeing. So honestly, it's probably best that we didn't drop a lot of bombs. Cause I, I mean, you have to have some discipline and so my discipline was going to be that I had to have a strobe and bomb offset bomb off the strobe. If I couldn't pick up the strobe, I wasn't just going to drop on the coordinates. I wasn't going to just drop out in the middle of nowhere. I had to have something to identify them and bomb off of that. Mm. There was a high chance there could have been some fratricide, you know, friendly fire by doing what we were doing. And it's, and that's the reason they looked at Wolf's tape and had a lot of comments and, he, you know, they didn't, they didn't necessarily investigate him, but it was almost to that degree of, because he had been earlier with someone who had gotten in trouble for going below 10,000 feet. So he had been grounded too. So he'd already been grounded once. And so they're like, okay, what's going on here, man? You're not no positive ID. And so, you know, once they listen to the tape and understand the situation, obviously they're like, okay, we understand. Mm. But, you know, it was looked at because it was frowned upon to be out there being a bunch of cowboys and they wanted us to be disciplined fighter pilots of which we are all trying to be. And that's ultimately how we operate. We don't go out doing unbriefed, un, you know, safe, cowboy stuff and if you do you're you know you'll lose your wings and no one wants to lose your wings so um on, on that uh, just i mean i guess sort of last question from me ned but but on that question then of fratricide the possibility of fratricide is that also something that plays on your mind i mean emotionally sort of psychologically as i said earlier it's clear that this has had a big impact on you it's something that is you know, something you had to deal yeah, with. Yeah, I mean, they, part they of gave that, us, part of yeah, they gave idea us a lot of briefings. Me. Yeah, we had a lot of briefings about this because uh, I think some air guard guys uh, earlier before OIF, I think in Afghanistan, had dropped on friendly fire. And it's, I mean, it's a big, it's a bad, it's a bad deal. I mean, you can go to prison. So, you know, yeah, first off, you don't want to kill someone who's a friendly person, for one. That, that's number one. But two is now you're 
you're, you potentially going to be making big rocks into small rocks in prison somewhere. So who wants to do that? Because you were trying to serve your country and do the best you could in combat. And yeah, I mean, honestly, it easily could have been some frat the way that I was going to execute that tactic of mine that I pulled out my rear end at the moment of just offset bombing off the strobe. You're 300 meters surrounded. All right. Well, I can help you take care of that, you know? And I think, you know, when you go back to like your background of like your spiritual background, your faith and so forth, I go back to the background of, Hey, when I was growing up, I had, you know, we're, we like fast cars and I'm spinning tires on dirt roads. I was driving before, you know, I had my license on dirt roads and we're shooting fireworks out of the back of convertible cars. And, you know, I mean, all these child childish shenanigans and as teenagers that would, you know, be considered terrorist actions today, you know, that was fun to do. And it was fun to buzz your hometown. And, um, I, in the F-111, I went supersonic over the North Sea out over the, out past the wash Mm -hmm. on the, on the East coast. It was a cross country mission where, you know, they give two lieutenants the keys to the F-111. You're like, okay, you guys can go to Germany or wherever you want to go, drink beer and have fun and fly jets. And so we're over the wash and I coordinated with the Kraut and global guys there and Kraut to, uh, make a phone patch to my parents. I said, we're going to go supersonic. And I said, I don't know if it'll work. I knew it would. I mean, we're on the, using an HF radio. And so this little airman at Trout and Global bought into it. And I said, yeah, Chuck, Chuck uh, Yeager went supersonic the first man, but he never called his parents doing it. So (laughs) we we went supersonic. I'm talking to my mom and dad on HF radio phone patch. So, I mean, I, I just kind of grew up with that idea of noise and flares and fireworks and so forth. So deep down, it's like, oh, you know, I'll drop flares. I'll, I'll go fast, make noise. Mm. Um, you know, it was already built into my demeanor. Mm. You know, we're, my dad had an appliance and TV store when I was growing up. And so when I was flying the F-111, I, I, acquired a video camera which at the time in the in the 1980s not everyone had these little video cameras so i'm out we're out doing you know 200 foot low levels doing the tfr terrain falling radar and i'm video and all that and so me and this other guy i won't mention his name we're we're flying down Loch Ness at 50 feet you know we had a radar altimeter and he's steadily focused on 50 feet and i'm out there videoing you know this is the kind of stuff we do, you know, and you know, what kind of guys do you want flying jets? You know, guys that are going to not be afraid to go and have fun every once in a while and be serious too, but yet lighthearted. Hmm. Your, your videos are online, aren't they? You've got a YouTube channel with some of those. Some of those. Yeah. <laughs> I put them on so I wouldn't lose them. Oh, did you? Okay. I, I put them on there because I, it's just, the videotapes are getting very old and brittle and a few of them are broken. And I was, I don't really have the best computer for digitizing that stuff. And so I, um, yeah, I put them on YouTube just to, so I could archive them. Ned, it's really been a a treat for me to, first of all, you know, speak to you again after such a long period of time, but also secondly, I think to really see this uh, unvarnished retelling of, uh, this experience let's not call it a mission let's just call it what it is this experience and i really uh, i'm sure the audience will will join me in thanking you for doing that and for um you know the benefit of sharing it warts and all with us so, so thank you so much for, for sharing it with us appreciate your time oh thank you for the opportunity um i've always enjoyed talking to you it's been a pleasure to to be featured in one of your books and that's always one of my top honors to to be in your boat. All right, so this is going to be the initial call, and we're up about 24,000 feet. And uh, can you see my cursor as well? I can, yep. Okay, and this is the airspeed over here. Uh, This is the Gs. And um, so this is the flight path marker, which 
Um, that's where you're going in space. If you put the flight path marker on another airplane, you're going to hit that airplane if you continue or a point on the ground, for example. This is five degrees, nose up, and this is, you know, there'll be a line, dotted line going down. Um, and and anyway. so everybody understands there's no, so there's no FLIR picture on this. This is just what you saw through the HUD, so that it's not like the Block 40 where you would have um, a, a forward-looking infrared picture. Right, this is a it's Block just, 30 uh, HUD, yeah. so, but I can see this with my MVGs, and with MVGs, this would all be green. You'd be able to see the ground and see targets and whatever, um looking through the head just like it was just like it would be in the daytime but it doesn't show up in the take that way and i never saw the ground anyway so um but when i say ir strobe the ir strobe that they have it's like a little flashlight and they can make a roping kind of like it, there, it's like shooting like it's, it's almost like these laser pointers now that they have you know that you can you can, you know, airliners and stuff are getting blinded by guys with these things now, but I'm not sure if it's the same kind of device, but nevertheless, you can see it's like a rope, like a, someone with a rope and it's like this, the air, um, picture of that is it just looks like a beam of light. It's, it's shaking back and forth like a rope. And so that's how a lot of guys, um, can find a certain point on the ground. And that's called um, Firefly? Is that the code name for that? Firefly? I, I think so, okay. yeah. All right, so here we go. Man, Hot 53, we're eight miles out from those coordinates. We have called them totally around it. All right, so that's the initial call, and you can hear there's two different guys. It's like, oh, Roger, you know, and then the other guy is saying, we're surrounded. And I'm like, two, trail, let's go down lower. So, I mean, it's almost, there was no, you know, let's, let's think about this and this hover up here you know orbit for a while it's like let's go down lower that's just immediate response from the north can you confirm yeah we're back there the enemy now is around us they have turned out all the way so again, you can hear the, 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 the one guy who was calm and the one guy who is definitely in a bad situation. And then I'm on VHF. I'm telling Wolfman, I'm in a left-hand turn because he's trying to keep track of me using saddle and it's hard for him to see me with his MEGs. Um, so that's the situation there. Now you can see I'm in a 90 degree bank turn here. I'm trying to roll in. This is where you get yourself screwed up. Especially, you know, I'm at 8,000 feet and not even looking at any of this. I have a stroke. I have a stroke. I'm trying to position. I'm. It's like you got the strobe, but you're like. I'm too, I can't roll in on it. I'm, it'd be too steep. And so now I'm like, I'm trying to, I'm trying to look out to the left and I'm trying to get some turning room and, I'm, but I kept losing the strobe and then I roll in and I'd lose it. So then it's like, it's frustrating because you're trying to just roll in, find the strobe, drop a bomb. Now this is when we were, this is when we went out and now I'm just going to drive in to the point and try to find it. And so I'm not in a CCIP mode. I'm in a CCRP, which is basically a mode that you would drop a system lay down or you would drop a JDAM. Um, 
and I'm looking for the strobe near my target target or TD box is what we call it. You'll see that in a second. Okay, turn your strobe on now. So the TD box is this. This is where I'm looking in this area for them, and I've got everything turned down. I can't even really see my HUD. I can only um, I can make out the TD box and my flight path marker. Strobe on now. Strobe is on proposition. And right here, this is arm. I'm I've got the bomb armed, and what I'm going to do as soon as I click see the strobe is I'm going to click off. CCRP and go to the CCIP mode and just drop the bomb. But how did you? How did you? I'm not seeing anything. Turn it on. Transmitting on guard. You got a sprint in progress on guard. Turn your strobe on. How did you? Check out two. How did you? Roping, roping so they say he's roping, you know, that's what I was talking about. He's just doing this with his strobe. So you can see this roping kind of um, image in your MVGs. And so as I came off here is when uh, Wolfman uh, picked up the strobe and I cleared him in. Uh, we also had someone saying, hey, you're on guard. It's like, yeah, no kid, we're on guard. <laughs> So you got these little distractions. You're now on foot. You're now on foot. We have got a strong. We can't get the strong on the position. Take it. Cosmo, I'm lost. Deck down, deck I have no strobe. I have no strobe. I can't help you if I can't see you. Now, okay. So, yeah, I'm, you can tell I'm a little frustrated and we're getting a little pissed. <laughs> Not at them, just at the situation. I can't help you if I can't see you. All right. So, this clip coming up next right now, this is Wolfman's HUD. And this is the CCIP mode. And so, this is the flight path worker and this is the bomb fall line. And then this is the pipper here. And then right in the middle is a little dot and that's a deaf dot. So he's gonna, he dropped his bomb really quick right there. So let me show that one more time. I have no strobe, I have no strobe. I can't help you if I can't see you. So yeah. So you know he's he's dropping on just an unknown point there based on the stroke. And so uh the flares, good flares. That's my channel. So anyway, that is that's the the main clips, the most you know, impacting.
Thanks for tuning in to 10% True. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Feel free to subscribe, and if you're on YouTube, hit the bell button to make sure you get notified of the next episode. Thanks, and take care.